now and now we're recording okay. yeah i don't know what happened there it was probably something on my end but i think we're good now well i plugged in a second microphone so maybe it's the, it was my mic i don't know uh yeah but you could hear me in, with no problem right yep all right all right okay well um so first of all uh thank you so much for uh you know the, dedicate a bit of your uh, precious time to this um in informational you know, informal interview with me. Uh, and you're, uh, you're a student broadcaster or what? No, 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 no. I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a political science student, and this is just, uh, and I'm not part of any clubs. It's just a, um, regular one, one on one interview, uh, informational interview, for for me to, uh, for my class. But uh, I genuinely, I genuinely, I am uh, interested in the in the work that you do. Uh, in regard in regards to Marxist economics, and you know, yeah. curious about that, and how you want to update it to the modern um, digital age, as well as your uh, supposed uh, connection, well, at least former connections to the Venezuelan government, which you know, uh, I am Venezuelan myself, so I, I find that, as we discussed before, um, yeah, I found that detail intriguing for me at, at the very least. Yeah, my my connections with them are relatively minor. I've been to two two events that have been held by officials there, but that's I, that's it. Yeah, yeah. and they've uh, translated I, stuff. Yeah, I follow I follow your channel a bit. No, no, uh, uh, and I seen that. I think you mentioned once that uh, they try to reach out to you. Um. Yeah, they tried to reach out to you, but at the end they did not. Uh... Well, they, they they translated our book and there was a, had me over to talk about it, but I don't think it ever had any real impact on any poli anybody's policy. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess that's the case. Uh, the book you're talking about is uh, uh, the well-known one that you have uh, towards the new socialism, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm told that. that I'm told by Spanish speakers that the Venezuelan translation is poor, and other Spanish speakers have done other translations. Yeah, uh, that tends to happen. Uh, some translations are uh, the Penangos would go it's better than others, but you know, uh, hopefully they they re-release it if if they can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So. Um, and now that it's out of the way and uh, um, you know sound works now, uh, let's get right to the interview. All right. So first question. Uh, so how do you get exposed to the field you are you are uh, now involved in? How do I get exposed to it? Yeah, like um, um, uh, you, you you know um, how do you uh, first? Uh, okay, I can tell you that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, my stepfather was a British politician he, for, for the Labour Party, who died when I was in my early 20s. When did he die? Probably 78 or something like that. There was a series of memorial lectures held in his name in the area that he used to be a uh, representative for. And in the 1980, I can't remember, it was 84, 85 one, uh, or maybe it was 83, the, the, the lecture was going to be given by the new leader of the British Labour Party, Neil Kinnock. And his speech was basically one where he was saying that the Labour Party had to give up on its old policy of bringing the means of production into public ownership, which was the established policy of the Labour Party in the past. Um, and as a justification for that, he cited a book by Professor Nove of Glasgow University called Economics of a Feasible Socialism. Now, I had had a look at Nove's book and had not been entirely convinced by it. 
um, but it didn't seem an important issue because it just seemed uh, it just seemed an academic book. When I saw that it was being used to to shift the policy of the the you know the, one of the two main political parties in Britain uh, against its long-standing policy of, of nationalizations. I thought it would be worth producing a critique of Alec No's book. So Towards a New Socialism was really produced as a response to the book written by Alec Nove. Um, I, I had originally been an economist, but I'd become a computer scientist. So I, thought the claims that were made in that book about the impossibility of planning just didn't seem to stand up from what to what I knew about what computers could do at the time. So I went and talked to people at the supercomputer centre in Edinburgh as to how, how they would solve certain class of problems and they said well the, these can be easily solved iteratively. Um, and I got together with a friend of mine, Alan Cottrell, who was an econ a professional economist, and together we wrote the book. We wrote the book in the late 80s, so it was two or three, year, two or three years after the, this listening to um, the leader of the Labour Party being influenced by Alec Nove. So it, it took, a, we, before we, before we wrote the book, we wrote an article um, outlining some of the ideas and then went on and wrote the book. See, so the article was, um, so the article was like preface? Yes, uh, the article appeared in the journal Economy and Society sometime in the late 1980s. I can't remember exactly. I see, so the, the argument was the same, but in your book, that uh, you wanted to much um, further developed, you know, yes. putting more detail about your yes. argument against. Yeah, uh, and the, the the other thing that was happening at that time was that you were getting perestroika in the USSR. Oh uh, yeah, and the there and similar ideas to Noves were um, influential there. And at the time, during that period, Alan was actually teaching in Moscow. Um, so the, that was a, a factor feeding into it as well. I see. Um, for, um, I know this is a bit off topic, but how long uh, did you taught in, in, in Moscow? How, I, 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 like, I, I, I know, I know I, you, you briefly taught there in the 80s, but how, how long have you... I didn't teach in Moscow. It was my colleague, Alma uh, Cottrell, who was teaching uh, in Moscow. I see. But, but you, but, but I you don't been... speak Russian. Ah, I see. But you've been there before? I've been to Moscow, but uh, I, I'm not, I don't understand Russian, so I wouldn't be in a position uh, I see. to you teach could, there. Then you couldn't talk, uh, yeah, you couldn't talk uh, your expertise there because you don't uh, quite get a hang of the language. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, um. <clears throat> Yeah, it's quite interesting um, uh, background. Uh, by the way, at the time when you got, you know, got familiar with the field due to your background, you know, with the Labour Party and everything, uh, back, back at the time, uh, were you uh, already well, uh, you know, uh, already uh, well, do you already know about uh, Marxism at the time? I, like, do you I, read? Um, I was trained as an economist, and I read Marx when I trained as an economist. Uh, I see. Well, so when you when you study internet economists, you read Marx. Of, of course, eventually you get to read uh, him among others. Yeah, that yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. All right, so we should move on to the next question. Uh, what are some aspects of your career that entice you into pursuing uh, pursuing it full time? To pursuing what full time? Uh, you know, uh, since you're, you're a professor, right? I'm retired now. Ah, okay. Okay. So at the time, uh, you know, uh, when you were becoming a, an economist and a professor and maybe a lecturer, uh, what, um, 
what aspects of that that job they didn't they didn't uh, okay I mean, to the student full time before you retired. It I can't say that it was uh, necessarily a strategic plan. After I got my PhD, I actually went and worked in industry as a computer designer. Um, then during the recession of the late 1980s, the company I was working for went bankrupt. And it was a company called Memex. Memex. It was taken over by another firm, but it was a company which produced data retrieval machinery. And I had been working on cheaper versions of it that would run on PCs um, from the point of view so that people could find files and stuff that they'd lost on their PC. They weren't interested in that. They mainly want to sell large, expensive versions of it to the CIA. And um, that, I think that was a poor, at the time it seemed a poor business uh, plan and they went bankrupt and we were given 15 minutes to to leave the building. Uh, one morning we came in and the the receivers or liquidators turned up and turned everyone out of the building. So I, I had to look for another job and as it happened the first job that came up was uh, an academic teaching job. So that I, that's how I got into ac academic uh, work, not because it was a long term um, desire, but because the commercial sector that I was working in was going through a recession and there were no comparable jobs available at the time. I see. So was um, yeah, so, so was some uh, more a preferable alternative to, towards it, it 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 had the advantage that yeah, of just, advantage of job of it, security i suppose as job security the pay was a lot worse the um advantage was that i had more time to do some research of my own on the other hand when i was working in industry i was in a position to define the the products that I wanted the company to design and I would design the, the, these things at my own initiative and they just the, the R&D department took took my suggestions up and did it so I was able to you could push something to the point of being actually manufactured which you couldn't do in um, if you're working in, in, in a university so although when I went to work in the university, I did design a number of new types of computers and built them, there, there was no prospect of them or little prospect of them ever being sold. I see. Well, yeah, they do experiment a couple of things in your universities, especially when it comes to, uh, you know, technological advancements. I mean, heck, well, some of the uh, more, um, you know, most famous websites in the internet, like uh, Facebook, was uh, kind of designed uh, uh, in university in university before. Yeah, but the the the, the, the issue is, is that it's that the, the period of the late eighties, early nineties was just about the last period when it was possible for you to do serious hardware research at a university. The problem was that uh, from then on, the, you, it was not worth building anything unless it was built on a chip. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. In the late yeah. 80s, early 90s, you could still build relatively innovative things using multiple chips. The, or, the superconductors? You, sorry? Uh, yeah, because I'm aware that super uh, you use superconduct uh, that thanks to superconductors that um, uh, the no. device no 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 S superconducting machines are, are not a serious prospect. I see. Uh, if I remember correctly, I thought it was the um, because of superconductors that that were able to like ma make computing devices like smaller and slow. Uh, 
smaller as the years not go by, or is that no. another aspect of it? There was a lot of hope about superconducting technology really in the, the sort of late 1970s to 80s or so, but uh, it, it, it had too few advantages over standard silicon te technology to, to ever take off. The problem is that with, with silicon technology, there's been decades of effort gone into shrinking it and making it smaller and faster. Um, the, the potential advantages of, of superconductors are relatively small um, and the offsetting disadvantages of having to cool everything to liquid helium temperatures are so great that it's, it's never been a viable prospect. Uh, it's experimentally interesting, but it's never something that's um, see, so it's more turned into a, a, a saleable product. Yeah, okay, so uh, what is the, the thing that allows computing systems to like become smaller uh, in space? Like what makes them smaller is, is, is um, improved lithography. Um, the ability to make photographic masks smaller and smaller and that the, the the one the ability to focus an image uh, and how sharp you can focus an image depends on the wavelength of the electromagnetic radiation you're using and the advances in getting smaller and smaller feature sizes have come down to using first moving into the ultraviolet wavelengths and then into the hard ultraviolet wavelengths so that you can shorten the, the feature size. You know, people are operating with, um, you know, seven nanometers as the best feature sizes now, the, the very latest products. And when you think that optical visible light is 0.7 of a micron or 700 nanometers, you can see that the that you've had to go way, way below 100 times shorter wavelengths than visible light to be able to focus these. And, and very few companies are able to produce the imaging technology that can create images that small. It's because of imaging technology then computing devices are becoming smaller every year. Yeah. No, not yeah. because of superconductors. Okay, that makes, that makes sense. Very interesting. Should look up, should look that up maybe more. All right, so let's uh, move on to the next question. Uh, what are some aspects of, what are, what were, in this case, because you're retired, uh, what were some aspects of your job that you find enjoyable and personal fulfilling? What do I like doing? Um, but it's, it's quite um, fulfilling when you see that you've taught people things and they've, that, that they've come on as a result. Um, from the standpoint of what I enjoyed, I, I enjoyed inventing things, basically. Uh, I think we're In either inventing hardware, software techniques, what have you. Cool, cool. All right. No, it's great. Great to know. <clears throat> and it's good to know that, that, you, uh, that you very much enjoyed uh, the kind of profession you were involved in before retiring. Okay, so the next question. Uh, what what were the most difficult things uh, that is associated with that what uh, the uh, that is associated with the kind of position you had uh, that that you previously writing made. applications for European grants. Oh uh, yeah, that's uh, writing yeah. applications to get money from the the European Union. 
yeah, I, I bet uh, that kind of system is, uh, you know, because of the bureaucracy, it kind of, you need, there's a lot of regulations, so that kind of makes sense. It's a great deal of time and effort goes into it, and okay. your probability of getting the money so, each time is relatively low. Oh, yeah, I bet. Uh, so it's uh, writing, uh, writing grant re requests, was it? Grant proposals. To ah, grant proposals, got it specifically to the European Union. European Union ones are much more complicated than those in the rest of the world because you have to get people in about five different countries to agree to, to the work that's got to be done. Or they won't, unless you've got five countries, they won't consider funding it. I see, I see. So you have to find five people in five countries. You have to agree among yourselves on something that's worth doing. And then you have to submit maybe a hundred pages of proposal. Damn, to, that's really long. To hope to get a, a, a get money. I see. Yeah, sounds pretty pretty time consuming. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So next question. <clears throat> um, so what are the Basic requirements such as knowledge, skills, or abilities needed for someone to be involved in the field that you were. Well, I mean, you in any academic field to be successful in it, you you, you have to have a an in depth knowledge of some particular area in it. Um, it helps a lot if you have broad knowledge as well, but probably from the point of view of academic success, it's better to have very detailed, narrow knowledge. I see. Um... Well, so, so it's good to, um, so if it's beneficial to have particular knowledge of the, um, uh, of, of the, um, of the profession, right? Obviously, yes. Uh, okay, okay. So, yeah, that's, that helps a lot, yeah. All right, so next question. Yeah, it shouldn't too long. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> So what kind of uh, job experience and level of education is required for, for, for that kind of field that you were involved in? Well, it ver it's varied over time. Um, when I first moved into it, computing science, you wouldn't, not everyone required a degree in it because um, they were taking a lot of people who had degrees in maths or physics or something like that. Um, and in, because, in computing. Yeah. In, the, if I, if, if you go back to the um, late 1970s or so, you, a lot of the academics had not got computer science degrees because the subject was too new. They, they, they might be mathematicians or they might be physicists or they might be electrical engineers. Um, nowadays, you're not going to make a, you will need at least a, a PhD and you will need some postdoctoral ex research experience before you have much chance of getting a permanent post. Okay, uh, so now you, you need what again? You need a PhD, of course, and PhD. probably you will have had to work for three to six years as a postdoctoral researcher. I see, I see. Okay, so three to something years, and then, uh, and then I get a PhD. Okay. That makes sense. No, you do a PhD first. Yeah, you do, then, you do the PhD first, then work in I mean, three to it, six it, years job experience. It, it, it may be possible for you to um, get into an academic research post if you 
had a PhD and then had worked in industry for a period. And I see, I see. If it was high tech job in the industry. Uh, of course, yeah, because that, that kind of profession does, does mix in uh, economic, academic work and uh, computing technology. So, you know, it kind of makes sense that right now it needs a lot of expertise and knowledge, especially of how much uh, that technology has advanced, like Jesus. All right, so uh, next question. Uh, yeah. So what specific skills has helped you the most in doing your work more efficient, uh, that has helped you before in doing your work more efficiently back then? What, I mean, what I always advised the PhD level students to do was to get as broad a knowledge as possible. I would advise them all always, I would advise them to subscribe to scientific, general scientific journals, okay? So subscribe to something like nature or, or science, a high quality general scientific journal, so that you're aware of the developments across a range of the sciences. Because it's, it, it's very frequently the case the ideas that are developed in one of the other sciences may turn out to be useful. So basically, I, I would say, develop as broad a scientific education as you can. Yeah, really good advice. You know, try to learn as, as much as you as you can when you go along that path. Yeah, pretty good advice. All right. So next question: uh, Is there anything important that that you that that you know future students who are pursuing this career uh, will need to know to successfully enter this field? Which field are you talking about? Are you talking about the field of um... Marxist economics or the field of computer science? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I, well, since I'm a political science major, um, I, I will be in Marxist economics. So, um, okay, you know. well, I think to, to, sit, to, to make a useful contribution in that now, you need to, obviously you have to read classical works by Marx and the, the other classical political economists. You should be familiar with Adam Smith and Ricardo. Of course. Of course. Um, you should try and read some of the other famous economists in the original. But it's also, I would say now, you should You should be good at linear algebra. Of course. You should um, have a fair familiarity with statistical techniques and conceptually you should read up on econophysics and ideas from statistical mechanics. Does statistical what? Statistical mechanics. Ah, statistical mechanics, got it. Yeah, yeah, since it involves a lot of economics, of course you need to learn about statistics and all that. So it makes no, sense. I, I'm not just saying statistics, I'm saying statistical mechanics. Statistical. Um, so how is that different than uh, regular uh, statistics? It's the branch of physics that deals with large complex systems um, and understanding concepts like entropy. And you can, and you can use that uh, to, of uh, in, um, when apply, you can apply that to, um, you know, yes. st statistics. You can apply that to the economy because the economy is a, a, oh, a large economy. chaotic system. Okay. Of course. And yeah. the, the point about statistical mechanics is it, it is a paradigm, paradigmatic example of how you can, when reasoning about 
a complex system with a high number of degrees of freedom, you can still infer macroscopic properties of such a system. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know something in the natural what well, in I don't know physics counts as natural science, but yeah, yes. one of those sciences could, could be applied to uh, yes, I mean, know, the, the economics. The, for, for instance, I, I have a book out with uh, one of the co-authors is a professor of prof classical econophysics. Classical econophysics. The one of the um, co-authors is a. A solid state physicist and he's made some very original contributions to showing how physics can explain the distribution of wealth. That is fascinating. I should look that up. Yeah. 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 All right. Um, <clears throat> okay, so pretty, pretty good advice. So let's move on to the next question. Uh, did you make up these questions or were they? Oh, I wrote, I wrote them down. I wrote them down a couple of days ago. So it, it may sound a bit similar, but overall, uh, I wrote them down. So, and, and are you going to use this for your fellow classmates? No, no, I'm not going to show it to anybody. I'm just going to, after, uh, after this interview is done and, and I stop recording, I'm going to send you the recording as we agreed. Uh, to you, and it will be for uh, and it will be yours alone to do uh, to upload to your YouTube channel if you wish. Okay, uh, and, so you're and I'll not keep using... my copy since it's mine, but I won't show it to anybody. It's just between okay. us. Okay, I, I assumed you channel. were. I assumed this was a project you were doing for your class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, this is a project. This is a, a work as, uh, that I'm doing for my, for my uh, political science class. Uh, I am. Uh, but you know, but it's also, uh, you know, but I'm genuinely curious about the work that you do because I've heard so much of, uh, uh, yeah, you know, the, uh, well, not thoroughly, but I kind of have a general idea of the work that you do, and I find it interest, uh, interesting the kind of work that you do, okay. uh, you know, as well as your connections, so of course. So yeah, um, <clears throat> now that's it. And uh, okay, so we're moving on to the next question. Okay, uh, so the next question is, what kinds of entry-level jobs will help me gain useful experience in this, in, in this field of uh, Marxist economics? You won't get it through a job. You'll, you, you'll get it through your own efforts. Uh, through, through what? You'll get, it, you'll get it through your own efforts. Uh, through my own efforts. Yeah, you have to work at it yourself. Yeah, of course, you need to work on that and get a lot of reading too. All right, okay, so next question. Um, are, are there any, yeah, are there any personal qualities that someone in this uh, field of Marxist economics should have so that they can do well uh, in this, in this uh, kind of career? Well, if you're going to succeed in any theoretical field you have to w be willing to work hard and and spend time of course dedicate yourself to that uh, and you have to have a real interest in it of course of course Let's... Yes, no good advice, of course. Um, okay, so next question. Uh, don't worry, we're almost done. We're almost done. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so was there any other career and or, uh, you know, and or field that you were interested in uh, before, uh, you know, landing in, the, in this uh, unique uh, uh, field or career that you were in of, Marxist economics and computer and computer science. Well, when I first went to university, I probably wanted to be a physicist, but uh, and that was my best subject. But 
I decided that because I only got a B in maths uh, and A's in physics, that I probably wasn't going to do well enough in physics later on if I only had a B in maths. So I decided to change. I but uh, conceptually, physics was what was most interesting to me. But I found there was a lot of very interesting stuff in economics when they shifted. Of course, of course. Yeah. Okay. So, so you're gonna more of um, <clears throat> you got a more interesting. Uh, so, so because you were better at math, that's the reason you couldn't pursue. Uh, no, I, I, my feeling is thought. My feeling was to become a first-rate physicist, you had to be a first-rate mathematician. Uh, and I was second-rate at maths. Ah, uh, of course, of course. Okay. Okay, uh, that makes sense, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I did, wasn't getting an A, I was getting Bs. I see, I see. So you wanted to be the best uh, in, the, in the physics field. Yeah, but I, I, My I feeling was that to do theoretical physics well, you needed you, you to be needed better to at like, maths yeah, than I was. Yeah, yeah, that makes yeah. sense, yeah. Yeah, I get that because uh, oh, when I was like around high school, I, uh, I I was pretty good at math. So I thought jumping to physics would be pretty good. But after taking a few um, uh, physics classes in my in my community college, I, I realized like it, it was a really tough subject. Pretty interesting, but really tough subject. Uh, and, and because of math classes got really tough. So uh, and really and really complex. So you know, I was unable to like keep up the A's and B's that I was getting before. So that kind of makes sense. That it, yeah, that's kind of like a feel real real difficult to get um, to truly learn. Uh, pretty fascinating, but pretty difficult to learn in general. So yeah, I, I get I get the struggle. All right. Okay. So next question. Okay. Here here it is. Uh, knowing that there were other preferable career options, such as physics, uh, will you still have chosen your current career field if given the opportunity to choose once more? Well, uh, well, you know, the one that you were before retiring. No, I, I, I think, I, who can say what contribution you would have been able to make in some, something else? Uh, I, I think I've made a good enough contribution where I am. Yeah, you did. It's pretty interesting the kind of work you have that they published. That makes sense. Um, <clears throat> okay, so next, uh, second to last question. Uh, what is the kind of work, uh, wait. yeah, yeah. So what is the kind of work that you usually did in your field? Because I, I have a general idea that, you know, that you did research and you published books, but was there something else? What, what did I do work, what did I work on? Um, well, I'd say from the, in the eighties, I worked mainly on databases and programming languages. From the late eighties to the mid nineties, I mainly worked on hardware topics, new designs of machines. Um, from the late 80s, mid, mid 90s onwards, to, I worked on things like data compression, video phones, um, compressed databases, parallel compilers for parallel programming, um, 3D television. Um, Computer vision, robotics. Yeah, that's a, that's a lot of work. <laughs> pretty interesting. Pretty, pretty, pretty interesting. Pretty interesting uh, research you got involved so there. On uh, computer science and robotics, and pretty wide. Okay, so uh, here's the last question. Uh, is there any advice that you will give someone pursuing uh, the, this career in, uh, yeah, you know, slash field that, that you used to have? Not just in, uh, uh, you know, what kind of advice will you give to uh, someone in, uh, aspiring, uh, you know, to get into Marxist economics, 
and, and later you can answer the, the okay. same thing I mean, from computer science. It, it, if you want to get into Marxist economics, you've got to get involved with politics as well. Okay? Because the motivation for it isn't purely academic. The motivation for it is to boost changes in people's life circumstances. So you, you've, you should get yourself involved with some working class political party outside of the academic environment. Of course. That's, that's really good advice. Yeah, you should. It's, um... to, to meet, you should, through that, you, you'll meet people outside your social class. Of course, so yeah, yeah because it's, it's meant to, yeah, it's, it's meant to appeal to a, a, you know, to a, appeal to the masses, you know, because it involves them. So of, of course, uh, and it's true, uh, you know, it's not a, it's not a, all about theoretical contributions, but also how it actually affects people. So of course, I'll, uh, you need to be more versed in uh, in political matters, and and you have to talk to people who are not not other academic people of course yeah yeah of course you need more that you know exposed to new ideas and all that and how and how reality is as you see it you know what are the material conditions because what, what, but, you know Marx, marxism is a science after all so yeah. you have to look at what experience if you're at university, you're acquiring skills, which will mean that you're likely to earn above the average. You're likely to be somewhat better off than the average employee. And it's important that you at least are in contact with organizations of people who are not as well off as you. Of course, of course. Yeah. Yeah, it's all the to, <coughs> yeah, it's really good advice, right? Yeah, everybody should keep that in mind in general. All right, so that's about it. That's all the questions I, I have. So, uh, thank you so much, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Kaksha, for, for yeah. your precious time in this uh, informational interview. I learned a lot about Marxist economics and computer science, which is a really nice uh, extra there. So it's always good to know other, other kinds of fields and skills. So as we agreed uh, in the emails, I will send you, uh, I should stop the recording right now, of course.